Welcome to the Rated Rabbi Sports Card Podcast, where sports cards and pop culture meet the 1984 All-Star Game. I am your host, Rabbi David Spinrad. Welcome back. Welcome if it's your first time. This is episode 26, A Blonde, An Albino, and A Goldie. Episode 26, A Blonde, An Albino, and a Goldie. But as we begin, I want to offer a special thank you to all of you who checked out episode 25, Behold the Master Set. We took it on the road to a different section of Dave's Cave, and I got to show you my completed 80-card PSA grade master set of the 84 All-Star Game. It was really, really fun and rewarding. Thank you to, uh, oh my gosh, so many people sent me comments, uh, direct messages, and put put a picture of the uh, the installation up on Facebook in one of the vintage groups, and uh, it was very cool. You know, it's one thing to... Uh, nerd in isolation but it's quite another you know, there's other geeks out there who are uh as geeky or if not more geekier in their own way also want to say thank you to ryan from homage for sending me this super awesome mensch of the month baseball hat that was really cool thank you ryan uh not only do y'all make amazing shirts at homage uh I'm oh, just very kind, very kind to see what I was doing on Instagram and send me the hat. A little product placement, I guess I can be bought. A baseball hat is my price, but not just a baseball hat because I'm the mensch. <laughs> I'm the mensch of the month. It feels good. It feels real good. All right. If you like what's going on here down in Dave's Cave, if you're enjoying the Rated Rabbi Sports Card Podcast, give me a like on YouTube. Leave me a comment. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, rate and review. God, it sounds so lame. <laughs> I'm very ambivalent about it. Do I want more people to check it out? Yeah, why not? It's kind of fun to geek out together. But on the other hand, like, I'm actually not doing this for attention at all. I'm doing this because it's just super fun. And I know I have a very narrow audience, but I'm actually really quite willing to... Uh, only get a few of you <laughs> if they're the right few of you. I don't need mass, mass commercial <laughs> success. And truth be told, I have a microphone in front of me all the time. I'm, I have the blessing and occasionally the curse of standing in front of the people uh, on a weekly basis, if not more. So this is just for fun. You know, this is just a good time. All right, let's get back to the game. We're in the top half of the second inning. Charlie Lee coming back, inning number two. The National League's all-star starting pitcher stands on top of the hill and looks in, and who is he facing? Reggie Jackson. Reggie in his final all-star appearance is still the name. The stance is the same. Slightly thicker with time, but still very fit, very powerful. But the reflexes, they're not quite there at all. This should be his last all-star appearance, like I said. He's reaching the end of the line. I believe his final card is 1987. He might have an 88 out there. I don't remember. I know it. When I close my mind's eye, I see uh, I see him in the 87 tops, the wood grain in that uh, Angels uniform. Anyway, Reggie steps in. The first pitch swings, actually gets good wood on him, but pops it way up high into shallow left field. Ozzy backpedals. You can see him drifting over a little bit in the swirling wind. He makes the catch one pitch and one out. In the pregame, Cosell sat with Charlie Lee to talk baseball, to ask him how he was feeling about starting in the All-Star game. He asked if this was the highlight of his career, and Lee was very polite. And Howard clearly had not done much homework. And I said, well, you know, throwing the no-hitter, that was a, that was pretty special. The no-hitter I threw against the Giants. And indeed, he no-hit the Giants May 10th, 1981. It was Mother's Day. Second game of a doubleheader in Montreal, a Sunday, the final game of an 11-game Expo homestand. And Lee came in as a spot starter. He'd been good in his first season, going 7-5 and five with a mid-3 ERA across 100 or so innings. Didn't really know where he was going to fit. Was in the bullpen, kind of going back and forth, but got 
the start. Dick Williams tabbed him to start the back end of a doubleheader. And Lee, man, Lee was a dealing. One of 16 no-hitters thrown against the Giants in their franchise history. It, I believe, was no-hitter number four in their San Francisco history. They've been no-hit many times since. But on that day, the story was Charlie Lee. He actually faced the minimum through the first seven innings. In the fourth inning, he gave up a walk to this guy. Remember Billy North? Billy North was a good ball player. Played 11 seasons, 71 to 81, mostly with the A's, Giants, a little bit with the Cubs and the Dodgers. Played in the 1974 World Series. Stole 75 bases in 1976. In 1979 for the Giants, stole 58. Here he is on his 1980 tops. He was one of those guys, if you're a Giants fan, like you tried to get excited about, but he was limited. Never an all-star, you know, played 11 seasons, had about a 20 war in his career. Good, not great, stole a lot of bases, got caught stealing a lot. Billy North, the only player to reach base in the first seven innings against Charlie Lee. In the eighth against the Giants, Lee started to struggle. The crowd, which initially in game one was 24, 25,000 as the temperatures dropped. Remember, it's May 10th in Montreal. Fans were there. A lot of them left after the first game, and many of them left early in the second. Temperatures dropping. They're saying that as the game went on, there were probably somewhere between seven or 8,000 fans left in the stands. Well, how many of them are the ones who left to somehow talk themselves into saying, no, I was there, I saw the double header. Like how many people really saw Chamberlain's 100-point game? Like really, really saw it. Gets a couple, gives up a couple of walks in the eighth, gets out of it on a double play in the ninth, has no problems Charlie Lee throws the no-hitter against the Giants. Six days later, this time a candlestick, he faces the Giants again, throws a four-hit shutout against SF. And for the month of May, Charlie Lee ends up going, wins four straight starts, allows one run in 35 and one-third inning pitched, and is the May National League pitcher of the month that's a long way on that charlie lee bridge to go where we're going next we're going to talk about the previous known hitter thrown against the giants on june 27 1980 an unseasonably balmy candlestick friday night dodgers in town dodgers against the giants on the hill for L.A., Jerry Royce, and for the San Francisco Giants was Vida Blue. Both of them would be NL All-Stars in 1980, but truth be told, the night belonged to Jerry Royce. Royce was actually in the bullpen as the season started. He wouldn't really have a, a spot in the rotation. Rick Sutcliffe coming off 1980 NL Rookie of the Year award. He was holding it down, but in 81, he has a, has a struggle. A sophomore slump. Tommy Lasorda puts Royce back into the rotation, and everything works for Jerry Royce. Oh, my gosh. He enters the game uh, with an 8-1 and one record, although three of those wins were in relief. A sparkling 2.08 ERA, and he was masterful on that Friday night. With two outs in the first, Giants hitter Jack Clark hits a bouncer to Bill Russell. Russell up with it and throws it wide, hits the baseline. Garvey can't get to it. It's an error on Bill Russell. Before I tell you what comes next, it gives me a chance to show off my 1978 tops. Unopened BBCE certified 1978 rack pack with Jack the Ripper in the front and center. So I always loved that Jack. He's got that kind of off color giants look like a picture is probably taken in 76 he's got the turf beneath his feet love this card love this rack my first favorite player clark aboard 
on the two out error it ends up hurting his knee on the play and would have to come out later no doubt contributing to Royce's ultimate no hitter on that day as Clark Crush lefties hit 384 the year and was a lifetime 371 against Jerry Royce after that two out error by Bill Russell I gotta tell you Jerry Royce just cruised that was it nothing Dodgers put up one in the first, so from the jump, Royce had a lead. They get another one in the second, four in the fifth, and in the seventh, Steve Garvey hits a home run to make it 8 nothing. Meanwhile, the Giants got nothing going. Royce was never a big strikeout pitcher. In fact, on this evening when he was throwing the no-hitter, he only would strike out two for the entire game. Got 18 outs on ground balls, eight on fly balls, one on a lineout. Starting in the eighth inning, the Candlestick fans got super, super into it. They're on their feet. They're cheering him on every pitch. They're cheering him on every out. But listen, not everyone was cheering Jerry Rice because little... Little nine-year-old Dave Spinrad was there that night with my dad, El Chacha, and my little brother, the shark. We were there upstairs behind home plate. So there may have been 23-odd thousand cheering for the Dodgers, but it was one less than capacity because I would never cheer for the Dodgers. I remember looking around downstairs, people cheering, eighth inning, you're cheering for the Dodgers, man. It's people next to me, you're cheering for the Dodgers. Go to go to the ninth inning, and it's the entire place, man. Kelsey Park's going nuts, cheering for the Dodgers. Nine year old me is like a I'm living a nightmare with two outs. I look around, the entire place is standing. And I look up, and there it is. My father, my own father, cheering for the Los Angeles Dodgers. I couldn't, I just couldn't believe it. The only thing worse than losing to the Dodgers would be being no hit by the Dodgers. The only thing worse than losing to the Dodgers and being no hit by the Dodgers would be to look there and see your father cheering for the Giants, losing, being no hit by the What did I know? I was nine years old. I had no sense. All I know is I I can't believe the Giants are going to get no hit by the Dodgers. I remember looking at my dad and like crying like, Dad, what are you doing? I had no sense of... Of anything, I was, I was nine. All I know is in my family we love the Giants and we hate the Dodgers. Finally, after the third out, everybody on their feet cheering this incredible performance by Jerry Royce. Only one error, only the Bill Russell error away from a perfect game. Man, oh man, oh manimal. I was there and I was just, I was bereft. I remember. I remember just bawling. <laughs> I mean, I, I can appreciate it now, but I couldn't then. Let me show you a couple of cool Jerry Royce pieces of memorabilia. This one is on the man cave wall, actually. I have a photo from the game on the wall in the cave. It shows Jerry Royce on the hill, bottom of the ninth inning, Dodgers leading eight to nothing they have 17 hits you can't see the errors on the in the photograph it's not in the frame but the dodgers have one error and the giants made a pair man oh man oh man royce on the hill there's that cyclone fence behind him you can see the space behind the fence and the permanent seats in the bleachers behind him is the culprit billy russell at the plate for the Giants with one out in the sixth inning. I mean, one out in the ninth inning. Candlestick crowd on their feet. Who was it? It was Joe Strain. <laughs> Second baseman Joe Strain. Man, I know things no human should know. Let's look at another Jerry Royce highlight. It's actually his 81 tops. Look, look at this guy. I'm going to take it out of the top loader and the penny sleeves. You can see it with no glare. 81 tops. Look at him just kind of like pregame, sort of got the, the gaze up into the seats, the sunshine on his got the Dodger uniform, Dodger white home uniform. And what I want to raise up to you is look how blonde, 
Look how incredibly blonde Jerry Royce is. Man. Jerry Royce is like, push you into the gas chambers, blonde. He's so blonde. Man, oh man, oh man. For some reason, I, uh, I always conflated. I don't know if it was a, a time of my life kind of thing, but I always used to conflate uh, Jerry Royce and really the the first the first like scary guy in a movie that I can really remember is this guy. If you're watching it at home, we're gonna show him to you right now. First guy I remember in the movies that was scary was this gonna get a little bigger. No, it was this guy. The albino. You remember the albino 1978 Goldie Hawn Chevy Chase neo noir rom com foul play? And the albino was the bad guy. This dude was so scary. Oh my God. Oh, the albino. Terrifying to me. So, what I found out about the albino was it's played by an actor, a guy named William Frank Father, and actually not an albino. Not only was he not an albino, he was an 80s television actor. Check this out. He was in all these 80s TV shows. He was in MacGyver, Night Court, 18, Hill Street Blues, Mama's Family. Got to give more love for Vicki Lawrence. Doesn't seem like she gets near the love. It seems like Carol Burnett's got her beat like 10 to 1. Listen, Burnett's an icon, but Vicki Lawrence, I think she's underappreciated. The albino man used to scare the living daylights out of me. Nothing like what my brother went through when my uh, my grandma Sarah read an outdated uh, movie movie guide in the San Francisco Chronicle. Took the bus all the way across town from the Sunset all the way to Van Ness. When she got there, the movies had changed, but darn it, she'd paid the bus fare and she took my little six year old brother in. Thank you very much, Nanny Sarah. Took my six year old brother in to see. The Exorcist and stayed. At what point? At what point in the movie did you think maybe we should go? My God, the blood and the head spinning and the priest. Uh, nanny, come on, he's six. And you know, he was never the same. He was never the same. I love him. I'll take him just the way he is. But you got to admit, Sharky, there's before the Exorcist and there's there's after the Exorcist. Nevertheless, the albino used to scare the crud out of me. Jerry Bruce, not the albino, but somehow would conflate the villain in foul play and this longtime lefty. Jerry Royce has a pretty darn good career. Better, much better career than William Frank Father. He wins 220 games in the major leagues, a 35.1 war. Pitches 22 seasons, wins 222, 220 games in 22 seasons from 1969, 1990 with the Cardinals, the Houston Astros, the Pittsburgh Pirates. He's an all-star in 74 with Pittsburgh. Plays for the Dodgers, 79 to 87, is an all-star in this season, 1980. Would actually finish second in the Cy Young to just, just a lefty, Steve Carlton, 1980 Cy Young race. Goes on to pitch for Cincinnati, California Angels, Chicago White Sox, Milwaukee Brewers, and then a final stop back with the Pittsburgh Pirates, retiring at age 41. And the moral of the story is kids, parents teach your kids to be lefties. Oh my God, you can pitch forever. You know, I'm thinking about how I made it to this game. This June 27th, 1980 game, school would have been out. would have been the best part of summer. Oh, my God. The best part of summer when you're a kid is when you've already been out of school, but it's still June. So it's like right now, if you are if you have kids and they're on summer vacation, this is the best time of summer vacation. June before summer starts, right? Oh, my God. I'm not talking like the schools that get out in May. I mean old school. You go back after Labor Day calendar when you're off. It's like, okay, question for you. Give me this in the comments. When you eat a, a deli sandwich, right, like on a, a sourdough roll, do you eat the big half first or do you eat the small half first? I eat the small half first. I'll tell you why. Because you eat that small half, you get like, ah, oh, that's a good, like you got into it, right? It's maybe like a third or 40% of the sandwich. You're happy. Then you look down and like, oh my God, I still got the greater part of the sandwich left to go. I'm, I'm satisfied with what I'm eating and there's more to look forward to, more to appreciate about this Fratelli Brothers 
<laughs> awesome deli sandwich. That's what summertime is like when it's June. Mm, mm, mm. So I think about my dad. My dad worked in San Francisco. We lived in Novato, about 30 miles north, northernmost city in Marin, more Hick than Crunch, more Petaluma, Santa Rosa than Mill Valley, than Sausalito, than Tiburon, to be sure. About 30 miles, depending where you were in the city with traffic, it could take you anywhere between 40 minutes to an hour. My dad was working south of Market, Soma, Arrow, Paper to Coast Paper right then and there. Uncle Frank, love you. Shout out, Unc. I think about my dad going all the way into the city, working, coming all the way back, going across the bridge again, coming all the way back up to Novato, picking up me, picking up my little brother, the shark, going all the way back into the city. And, you know, it's not like Candlestick is near the Golden Gate Bridge. You got to go all the way through the city out. Hey, sure, it's, oh my God, it's so far to take his boys to a ball game. Makes me think about... Uh, Makes me think about, makes me appreciate fathers and sons uh, and sacrifices. Fathers and sons and sacrifices. And how cool that was that my dad would go to work, come home, and drive all the way back in the city to, uh, to take us to a game. You know? I like to be a little bit like my dad. I'm trying to be you know, the best father I can. I had a an awesome role model, still have an awesome role model in my dad. I learned it much in you, dad. <laughs> oh my God. All right. What have we talked about today? We have talked about a little touchdown on Billy North. We spent time on Charlie Lee's no hitter against the Giants, which was really just a portal into Jerry Royce's no-hitter that I was at. I was brokenhearted. I was crestfallen. I was bereft. My beloved Giants being no-hit by the Dodgers, all the more so looking up at my mountain father. And the man was cheering for the L.A. Dodgers. Damn. Talked about Jerry Royce. We talked about the albino. William Frank father from foul play. It was great just to find out at age 52 he's not actually an albino. <laughs> Who knew? Talked about Goldie Hawn. Ooh, let's talk about Goldie Hawn. We haven't talked about her. Mm -hmm. Let's bring up a little Goldie Hawn photo. Just the uh, poster from foul play. Oh, my God. Goldie Hawn is just so cute. Just so cute. Just want to like, oh, you're so snuggly. You're so like cute and charming and likable. Like I love Goldie Hawn. And that, I really got the two of these right. Right, Goldie Hawn, Chevy Chase, both tons of charisma, tons of, of just, what's it, just like magnetism. Both of them very magnetic. They had chemistry. The movie, the plot, it's kind of weird and uh, not necessarily complicated, not necessarily to talk about right here, but just, just watch Goldie Hawn and something, you know, anything. Delightful. So we talked about a little bit about Goldie Hawn. Name dropped Vicky Lawrence. We're going to end on this. Not only have I seen a no-hitter in my life, I have seen two no-hitters in my life. Albeit, I do put an asterisk on that second no-hitter. Second no-hitter was thrown July 13th, 1991, Oakland Coliseum. I'm working as a vendor. I believe I was selling drumsticks that day. Drummies. Two bucks a pop. Money added up. Got a little commission. I think Oakland Coliseum paid 15% commission on whatever we sold. You get a sunny day ice cream with the collie. You can make some big money. Giants playing the Baltimore Orioles. I am working the seats selling drumsticks on the hill for the O's. Bob Malaki. Malaki goes six innings and his hand gets all, all tingly. Gets pulled, replaced by Mike Flanagan, throws a scoreless inning who's followed by mark williamson who's followed by greg olson who closes it out for the save and the two nothing victory a four player combined no hitter yeah so technically i have seen two no hitters in my life but that's not the one that gives me joy that's not the one that i have halcyon sweet memories of your really that was being with my dad and my brother june 1980, Jerry Royce, an 8-0 no-hitter over the San Francisco Giants. All right, 
good place to stop it for now. I will see you again, God willing, Friday. Until we see each other again, may you enjoy and may you be blessed with health and long life. So long for now.